Jay Delsey. Over there in one of the big chairs. Jay's athletic ability came naturally. The son of Jim Delsey, a major league outfielder for 10 years. Jay may have had trouble hitting the curveball, I don't know. But whatever reason, while loving all sports, he turned to golf at an early age. When he was 12, he worked as a caddy at Norwood Hills. He was one of the top players in the state in high school. He won the district championship, medaled the Missouri Amateur. UCLA came calling, and during his collegiate career while playing on that team that many think is the greatest college team ever, he, he uh, earned two All-American honors. When he graduated, he received his PGA Tour card, went on to play in 565 PGA and Champion Tour events. Jay never forgot his roots, though, and found the St. Louis chapter of First T, serving as honorary chairman of the board for the last 12 years. Currently, he owns his own company, Jay Dunsing Golf, serves as a commentator of the Fox Sports Golf Broadcast Team. We're honored tonight to welcome Jay Dunsing into the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame. <laughs> to interview Jay, to interview Jay, we welcome Dan Reardon. Dan has been covering golf for Cam Wex and CBS for over three decades. In fact, he recently returned after covering his 32nd consecutive Masters, 32 years in a row. He's, he, he said they told him when you get to 40 years, we give you a plaque in your own parking place. <laughs> Dan, you're up. Dan, we're in. What, Ron, what Ron didn't tell you is I told that woman that I can't guarantee that I'll be alive for that 40th. Uh, and I actually have played golf with Ron, and I don't remember those good shots. <laughs> I said there was only a couple. Well, it was with somebody else. Uh, a, a bit of trivia first off, uh, there's a little known fact dating back to when Dean Beeman was the commissioner of the tour. They put in place a rule, that's a little known rule, that any St. Louis bar and golfer must change their name to Jay. <laughs> and, and in fact, that's why Scott Langley is struggling with tour status. If he was just Jay Langley, he'd be out there on a regular basis. But Jay and I, have known each other since he was in high school. I literally can picture in my mind, he probably has blocked it out, but sitting behind the green, 18th green at St. Joseph's Country Club at the end of the state high school championship, talking about Jay was a little disappointed because the Junior Bills were not a particularly strong team, even though he was a really strong individual as a player. So it, it's particularly gratifying. I requested the opportunity to talk to Jay because that relationship goes back so far. I also caution Jay that, you know, I'm going to grill him, I'm going to put him on the spot tonight as we sort of do a little history with you. But go ahead. Can I turn that off? Go ahead. So, so the, first thing, the first thing I want to ask is that there's a story I've heard about you from your junior days in golf. And I've never asked you about this story, but it's a great story if it's true. Do I have to answer? Oh, yeah, this is easy. And if it's not true, just lie, okay? I was told that you were playing in a Gateway Section Junior event in Paradise Valley. And you, I was. I and, was. And you came to the ninth hole and you were one stroke down. I did. And I you aced the hole to take the lead. I also remember I forgot my golf shoes that day, so I played my basketball high tops. <laughs> the only shoes I had in my car. It actually wasn't even my car. I didn't have a car. So, so you come out of the junior ranks and you end up at UCLA. And I'm going to applaud Jay Haas for remaining seated when they talked about the greatest college golf team of all time. Because a lot yeah, of people- I wrote that, Jay. You know, I wasn't gonna talk about your team. I was gonna talk about our team. A lot of people will say that that Wake Forest team was the greatest of all time. And in fact, I asked- Why are you bringing this is my time right now? Why are you bringing it on now? <laughs> but I asked Jay, you can relate to this. I asked Jay what Jesse Haddock did for that team to contribute to their greatness, and he said they let them drive the van. <laughs> but your team had a whole roster of stars. Refresh our memory of the guys that were teammates of yours at UCLA. Corey Payton, Tom Pernice, Duffy Waldorf, Steve Payton, and I, and, and there were you know, probably two dozen really good California players, Mickey O'Coy, the guys that didn't go on to play and be successful on tour, but 
We won an awful lot of tournaments in the last two years. What was the dynamic of that group? You have a lot of different personalities, not the least of which is Steve Bates. Well, Steve Bates is a human volcano. He's, he, he's just priceless. I mean, I, I can remember some of the stories that I couldn't believe were true. You know, that I would hear him like, nobody's doing that. Nobody's actually doing that. No one's throwing the club across the freeway. Or no one is trying to actually kill the ducks that are walking, you know, along with us. And they're like, our, our, our guy's doing that. You know, he's got blood on his shoe because once he killed the duck, he kicked it for like three holes. <laughs> so, that's pretty much, that's pretty much our team. Uh, you know, we were a really competitive group. Uh, I learned an awful lot. You know, I, I went out there. Uh, I mean, started playing golf with my mom's clubs at a Muni golf course in North County and uh, didn't really even have a full set of clubs to like my junior year in college and then watched these great players play and, and learn and, you know, getting to watch somebody like Pavin was such an anomaly, you know, he, 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 he wasn't athletic, he went, but man, he could play great golf and he knew how to score. And so, and I, the only thing I could really do is I could smash it, you know, I, I, I was, I was just trying to learn how to find it after I hit my drive, you know. So, um, and when watching these guys, it just taught me so much. You know, and I was really competitive, so I just wanted to try to, you know, figure it out. You turned, you turned pro in '84. You're on tour in '85. Any story related to going through the tour qualifying? How? I mean, that's not such an automatic thing for people. It was pretty much hell. I mean, it's six rounds of golf, and you're never used to playing six rounds of golf, you know. And, um, the last two days of the Q school are like nothing you've ever experienced, you know. Um, you don't want to go anywhere near the men's restroom on the last two days of that. It's just a disaster. Everybody is throwing up and you know, they haven't even played yet. And um, it's, uh, it's, just, it's, it's just not easy. And, and I just remember trying not to think about anything. Just, just try to play and, uh, and not worry about what's going to happen. And, that worked for about three holes each day, you know, they have 15 more to try to squeeze through there. But um, they took 50 players back then. And it, it, it made it nice that, you know, if you had a little cushion, you could, um, you could make some mistakes coming down the stretch. And I, I think I made plenty of those. But I find I'm finishing like in, my, in the 20s, my, my first year, finished like tied for 15th or 16th. And then he had all these highs and, you know, yeah, we remember back then, we didn't have computers, we didn't have, any, you know, so you're like, on the PGA Tour, what does that mean? Like, oh, there's a tournament in Washington, D.C. So I fly to Washington, and I'm like, now what? I find a national rental car, uh, call Congressional to try to get directions, you know, and I don't know if you've ever tried to drive around, you know, Jan Jacobson's in here, got a family, I've been on tour all these years, and, and Jan Haas as well. There, there was such a community back then. You know, people actually really helped each other, and, and, and some of the older guys would help some of the younger folks, like try to figure out, man, don't stay on that side of the town, it's a, you know, it's a 45 minute drive to try to get to the golf course. But when you stay in a place like Washington, D.C., you can take two wrong turns and be in four different states. <laughs> you know? I'm in Baltimore, how far is Baltimore from Washington, D.C.? I don't know, you know, a lot of traffic and things like that. So, it was, a, it was a, for me, it was just like living a dream come true. How long did it take you until you felt like you belonged up there? You mentioned, you mentioned how you were in awe of your guys at UCLA. How about on the tour? When did you feel like you belonged? Yeah, you know, I was, on the way, I was in awe of the way they played golf. I wasn't in awe of anything else about them. You know, I, there, there was a lot of crazy going on, and it was really fun, but it, it was more about the way that they played golf. And um, the, other, the other stuff, the stuff on tour was, you know, not knowing... I, I was just an athlete, and I was just trying to, trying to, trying to play. I know that sounds like such a stupid thing to say, but like I wasn't a practicer, and, and I would much rather play. If I was trying to get ready for a tournament, I would have been better off just, you know, playing 27 holes every day and, and getting ready that way, and playing the course as much as I could. And some of the things, some of the mistakes I made were trying to do what some of the other guys did. You know, they spent all this time on the range, and they spent all this time working on their clubs. I mean, I just took a bunch of clubs because they were free. You know, I was like, I can't believe we get all this free stuff. This is fantastic. You know, and um, 
and then trying to figure, you know, that I just wasn't a technician. I was just kind of a field player that um, when I get out and, and look at a hole, something tells me this is what I should do, and that's what I would try to do. And, and I had some really cool, Andy North was just great to me, mentored me, and, and you know, as I, I played more like the guys play in today's game just back then, because I was really long off the tee, but never hit a fairway, and, and never hit a fairway. And, and, um, but you know, I, I could still play a little bit, and these guys were telling me that I got a one iron in my bag, and I started trying to hit fairways, which I was able to hit some fairways and learn how to play that way. And so it, it, was a, it was a great experience for me. The tour life, the camaraderie, the guys, the people, the families, it was, it was awesome. Love you posted wins on the web.com tour at the beginning of the, the 2000s, back to back years you did that. Given the fact that you'd already played or 565 tournaments on the PGA Tour, how important to, to you was it to validate your career with a W uh, on, in a tour event? You know, I can say, Dan, there's nothing like winning. I'm not sure winning on the web.com validates anything for me on the, on the PGA Tour. I don't think anything but winning on the PGA Tour validates that. Um, and, I, and I never did that. Uh, some of the, the courses I took and some of the choices I made were some of the reasons why that didn't happen for me. It wasn't, at least in my own mind, it wasn't about my ability. It's the way I, the choices I made to try to get there. You know, and I, at, at the time, I, I, I you know, I made the best choice I could. I didn't, for what I knew and, and the way I grew up and, and what I was, you know, shooting for, that I, I, I think I was doing the best I could. But if I look back at it now, I probably wouldn't do it the same way. Jim Holtbrief one time told me that when he played on the Champions Tour, one of the biggest difficulties he had, and I think Jay Williams, we've talked a little bit in that regard as well, he said he found himself always playing against the money list. That he was always aware of the money list, and he, he didn't play as free as he would like. How true was that for your career? Yeah, well, I'll give you a story. My f the first event I played in was at AT&T, and it was it was really a difficult tournament to play in. Horrible weather, and we were playing three courses. I'd never played them before. Cypress Point was actually in the rotation back then, which was fantastic. And I, so I, I missed the cut there, but I went to Hawaii the next week, and I won a finishing ninth. And I made thirteen thousand bucks, which is about as much as my dad ever made, you know, in one year of his career. And I was like, man, this is unbelievable. And we'd go the next week to Torrey Pines, where I won a college event uh, on Torrey Pines South, and I'd never played the North Course. And I'll never forget this. Um, I, I shot two hundred in the South Course, two hundred in the North Course. I'm out having dinner, and I call because they, they, they didn't text you. We didn't have phones to tell you what your teeth time was. I call, and I miss a cut. The cut was five under, and. I played three rounds on the South Course and won that college event at like four under par for three rounds. And I played one round there, two, you know, four under, and, and that had a huge impact on me. I was like, what do you mean I don't get to play? It's gotta be some mistake. But that's how good all, all these, these guys were. And, 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 and it was definitely influential. I mean, it was hard coming down to the last night holes in the event, not thinking about trying to make the cut because Shoot, if you don't make the cut, you don't make any money, you don't get a chance to win, you don't have, you know, there's a, there's a whole mindset that you had to learn going through some of the hard knocks of the tour to figure it out. Two more questions for you. We mentioned Corey Pavin a while back. When you and Corey were particularly close, there was a year you went back to Q school and he was on the bag. Yeah. First, well, all, first, dream year, I remember. first of all, without the mustache, it looks like father and son. Right. But, but what's it like, what was that dynamic like with a player of that quality who's on the bat? Yeah, so, <laughs> he, he, Corey and I have been through a, a, an awful lot. So it happened to him on the back. First of all, it said a lot about what, at that point in time, what he thought about our relationship. It was great for him to give, a, give that kind of time. And, um, you know, he's, he is completely a void of emotion. So, you know, regardless of how difficult the situation was, he was just like a calming influence. So we got going and he started talking about Ryder Cup stories. I'm like, damn, I watched that on TV. You know, that's what you were doing. That's what you were thinking. You were thinking about that way. You know, he chipped in once at, at Oak Hill and I was asking him about that. And I think it took like five holes for him to tell that story. I think I made a couple of birdies in there. So. It, it, that, that part was, was fun. I can remember one part significantly. We're coming down the stretch on the last day, and I'm right around. Each year, I think they kept cutting number of spots at the school. So instead of 50, there was you know 45, and then they give those five spots to the top uh, five money winners on the Nike Tour and the Web 
come towards them, which is you know, probably, probably the right thing to do, but they keep cutting the spots from the tour school. And I remember you know, thinking, man, I just want to make a couple birdies coming in so I can get this card. And I hit a shot in from probably about me to you on 16. And I said to him, what do you think of this putt? And he goes, I think it's just on the left edge and the putt broke like a foot, you know? And then I went and, and I missed the putt on 17 and then I had a putt on 18 and he goes, you need any help? I go, no, I'm good. Just go on in and leave me alone, you know? So I actually got it in and I, I wound up getting my card by one. But it, 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 it said a lot for him to give up that kind of time and throw the bag around, you know? It was nice. And then a, probably an unfair question. If you could take one round from your PGA Tour career that you'd like to have played over, what would it be? Oh man, I got so many of those, I think. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, my most memorable round, I shot 61 on a Sunday at Memphis. I started about 50th and finished like fourth. And I'll never forget this, my dad, who I love dearly, was watching and we got in the car and he said, how could you miss that puddle number 12? And I was like, Damn, Dad, I made every single one of them look at it. How'd you pick that one? Um, you know what? I, I don't know. I mean, I've had a lot of rounds where I've been disappointed where you're in, where you're really playing well and then you don't finish it off. And so I'd have too many to choose from. Uh, it's okay. I, I, said, it was I, I, I would have too many to choose from. And you should have prepped me for that. Call me last night. I'm not going to think about I can't think of anything right now. Sorry. I, I started with a piece of trivia. I'll end with a piece of trivia. Out of all the St. Louis born and raised golfers in this area, that 565 tour appearances is the all-time record for this area. Jay has played in more, but he grew up on the east side. And for the river. All in favor of Jay Delson. Thank you. Jay, stay right there. Jay, stay right there. Great stories, great stories.